Hello. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Hello. Should I start? Mm -hmm. um, per <laughs> <laughs> um, perhaps we should address that yeah. how Olivia is not here. Yeah, so um, Olivia Baez, my co translator, uh, and you know my very dear friend is unfortunately not here tonight. Um, if you've been following the news of what's going on in Catalonia and Spain, um, Olivia lives in Spain and got kind of caught up in everything, and uh, her flight couldn't take off. Um, and she wants everybody to know that she is 100% with the peaceful protesters in Catalonia. Uh, this is kind of just one more example of. Um, Catalonia being kind of repressed and uh, discriminated against, and um, and although she is very upset not to be here, she is happy about what's happening. Um, and I'm sorry to everyone who showed up tonight because they saw how hot she was on the poster. Um, but uh, she, I'm I'm very sad she's not here. But there's so much resonance with the text that you both translated, in terms of the political punctuating the day and then the Gdansk strikes that Marguerite Dura circles around so much in summer 80. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, Olivia sent me a text saying it was very ironic that this, you know, kind of some of the events that Dross likes to talk about in summer 80 about people, you know, the, the Gdansk strikes in Poland that happened in the summer of 1980, um, people rising up uh, in, in fighting for their freedom. Um, it's sort of, history repeats itself and it's repeating itself right now where she is preventing her from being here talking about that happening in the summer of 1980, so. Perhaps let's start then at this point describing the summer 1980 project and then, so that project and then the collaboration between the two of you um, and then also this text with Dorothy being a collaboration of sorts. So do you want to um, talk a little bit about this kind of conceptual project that Dara um, embarked on in the summer of 1980? Yeah, so so this book um, with Dorothy, me another writing, um, everyone should buy it. it it's half of, um, it's half newspaper writings and then the second half is this really lovely what we're calling a novella, though it's not really a novella, mm -hmm. called Summer 80. And uh, Summer 80 started, um, Duras was commissioned by the French uh, socialist paper, Liberation, in the summer of 1980 to write. She was The idea was she would write um, every week for the entire summer, um, from you know June to September, about the, the things that were happening at the time in the real world, so like current events, political events, whatever she wanted to write about that was happening, and it would be a column for this paper. And uh, her being de Ross, uh, she agreed to do it and then didn't really do it, and kind of did it completely differently than what she had said she would do. So not only did she not stick to the schedule, um, but also she, uh, it's, some, it, she does talk a lot about certain events that happen in that summer. So she talks about the strikes in Gdansk. She talks about um, the Moscow Olympics. She talks about other you know things that happen. But it's also it's very much um, like a hybrid text of this really beautiful story of this summer uh, summer camper and his camp counselor who seem to be having some kind of strange romance that is um, kind of that Duras is, is seeing, and uh, this is all fiction, um, but she's playing out the story as if she were watching it happen on the beach in Treville where she was that summer. Uh, and so it's sort of one sentence will be describing the sea and the camper and the counselor and their, their kind of forbidden love, and then the next sentence will be about the Moscow Olympics. And it's this very strange kind of jarring juxtaposition of fiction and nonfiction and the lines of you know, journal, like the idea of journalism getting very twisted and blurred um, when it's Duras doing the journalism. Um, and she kind of had described her own, she, she described her journalism as subjective journalism and, and said that all, she believed all journalism was subjective and it wasn't possible to be uh, writing about the world objectively. And you can really feel that in all of these pieces, um, which is kind of why they all fit together in this way. But 
Um, Summer 80 is, is one of the weirdest but most beautiful texts I've ever read in my life. And it's only Jaros could have written it. Bonkers. Yeah, it's absolutely bonkers. Yeah. And there's also stories within stories, like the, the, in the, within the story of the camp counselor, there's another story of a boy named David who's being, who's like having this interaction with a shark. Which was a story that Jara would tell her own son. This yeah. mythical story about and a that, shark and the violence right. of this Depre very de depressed shark. Yeah, very sad shark. Um, <laughs> and who like cries a lot and then this poor boy has to listen to the shark huh. cry and like vent about his life. And so that's happening within that story. And then also what's happening in the summer of 1980 is uh, DeRoss actually meets Jan Andrea Steiner who would go on to be, or sorry, Jan Andrea. Jan Andrea? I didn't know it was pronounced Duras until you started yeah, speaking. Duras. I've said Dura yeah. my entire life. A lot of people say Dura. Um, <laughs> Don't but, ask me about pronunciation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that's the summer that she meets this man who would become like her love obsession until the day she died. And so that kind of plays out. You think that she's writing about, at a certain point, her, the camp counselor and the boy clearly becomes her and Jan Andrea. There's so many different layers of address. There's so many it. things yeah. going on in this really short novella. It is mind blowing. It is so beautiful. And when I read it for the first time, I knew I really like someone needed to publish it. Someone needed to translate it. It needed to be in English as a whole. Do you know? So the lover came out in 1983. I'm not trying to quiz sure. you. <laughs> Came out a couple of years later, I think. Um, so, do you think that she was writing it at the same time? Was she working on fiction at the same time as she was doing this period of nonfiction? Well, she talks a lot about how she would write nonfiction. She would like write for newspapers and journals to like revive her fiction. There seemed to be like a, a decade in which she was working mostly for cinema. And yeah. making her own films and making screenplays and some sort of writer's block in a way. Yeah, and it's and it's this strange thing because she can't like she's being commissioned to write this thing about what's going on in the summer of 1980 for a newspaper and she just can't help herself. Like it just turns into fiction. And on every page, even like she's talking, there's this whole section in the book in which she imagines a conversation between one of the strikers mm -hmm. and and like an interviewer, but they're both her, obviously it's both her voice, and it's just there's so much going on in this, and I think um, it's also the first time she wrote in the first person in mm -hmm. her. Yeah, that's amazing. I didn't realize that. Yeah, and it's, it, we've just, we've seen it described, and we were, trying, kind of, as we were translating it, thinking of it as like this mini, what's the word, like not a think tank is not the right word, when you, like, like, like a lab, yeah, like yeah. some kind of experimental yeah. form that would shape the rest of her writing. Well, you get the sense with the lover, there's the uh, mingling of address, there's there's you, there's I, there's the girl, and you get that same sort of layering of memory. Yeah. The, the, the switching back and forth with, the, with tense, with point of view, with address. Yeah, I think you can see, a lot. she's doing a lot of things in this text specifically that you see later on and that you don't see earlier on. And it's sort of like this is a shifting point, which is, it's just so, it's so strange and it's so weird to read it and it's so powerful because it's so strange and because no one writes like this and because no one's supposed to write like mm -hmm. this. And, um, and I think that's probably why it never got published in English because mm -hmm. it's so uncategorizable and it's so difficult and it's so, baffling, mm -hmm. but it, it's so interesting. So the idea for, so how did you and Olivia come about wanting to collaborate it together? Because it, if I'm not mistaken, it's summer 1980 that was the first text that you really worked on. Yeah, so Olivia and I met um, in a master's in translation at the American University of Paris. And um, it was just, we kind of like from day one, our professors like smashed us together and we're like, you two need to talk and be friends and we just hit it off from from the go and go it's not a, that's not the expression you know what I mean from the jump um, from the get-go and she uh, she and I were both very obsessed with Marguerite Ross and talked about it all the time and I had been wanting to do something with with summer 80 but didn't really it, it just felt like such a daunting text and such a confusing text that I didn't 
want to go it alone. And I, mm. we, she and I had such a resonance with each other and the way that we thought about translation and the way that we connected to literature and the way that we connected to Jarrah specifically. And so I asked Olivia one day, are you interested in, in translating this book with me? And of course she said yes. And we started kind of slowly pitching it just summer 80. Um, and people were like, you know, not very responsive to it because it, it's just so strange and it's short and it's, mm -hmm. you know, what do you do with it? How do you market it? How do you talk about it? Um, and uh, then when we pitched it to Dorothy, like within the next, I think, two days, they had written back saying, oh my God, yes, we're interested in this, but it's too short. We want it to be part of a bigger collection. Um, can you, can we talk about like what it could look like as a bigger book? And because it was originally written for a newspaper and it was sort of Duras testing the waters of what it means to write journalism and what it means to, to write period. It seemed to make sense to, to put it with other newspaper writings where she was also mm -hmm. kind of exercising that and using newspaper writing as a way to just write, as a way to write mm -hmm. about what's happening in the world but in her, in her own particular way of you know, we can write about events in the world and inject ourselves into what we're writing about and what we're seeing in the world. And she, um, we really wanted to include this like very controversial piece. And, which one? Uh, the thing oh, she, oh, I know about which one. Petit Clégois. Yeah. Where basically, about, okay, yeah, um, the little, it was like <laughs> this big scandal in France. This little boy died and um, his mother was accused of, of murdering him. And you know, before she had had a trial, before anything had happened, uh, Duras went to her house and like forced this woman, this poor woman, to have like a mini interaction with her. And then she wrote for a newspaper about how she was absolutely sure this woman was guilty. Which like, you can't, you know. Duras was obsessed with crime. She, yeah, was, obsessed she was obsessed with, obsessed with, with crime. She was yeah. obsessed with like the Pop and Sisters. Yeah, if she and were these... alive now, this true crime phase we're in, she'd be loving it because she loved crime and she loved all of this stuff. And she, she like didn't see any problem with writing for a newspaper about a, tr a real case um, and inserting her own opinions into the guilt of this woman. And using fictional effects. Yeah, and in many it's ways. written like a short story, mm -hmm. but it's all, she's using facts, she's mm -hmm. using the case, she's using this real woman's story. And of course, you know, it became this huge scandal. How could she do this? This is so inappropriate. You know, she's just accusing this woman. She has no facts. She has no nothing. And this woman was eventually found innocent. Um, or if she even went to trial, I can't remember now, but she, you know, it was decided that she did not do this crime. And Duras had, had just said like gut instinct, this woman did it and wrote <laughs> it. And Olivia and I really wanted to include that because it's the perfect example of Duras blending fiction and nonfiction and this idea of subjective journalism. And also her wrongness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, which she's often wrong. Yeah. Um, and she, we, we were told it was too, too controversial. So, um, like, not necessarily by Dorothy, but by the French publisher that controlled yeah. the rights was like, please don't, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> don't translate this. Yeah, like, just let it go. Um, but we do have, there are a couple of pieces, true crime pieces in here, which are yeah. lovely um, in a very Duras way. Like, she's, there's one piece in here about a court case um, for this woman who is accused of and found guilty of having murdered her lover. And she'd been engaging in these kind of, like, not these, you know, what was considered at the time like perverse sexual games with him, which was probably just like she like tied him up or something. And um, they, the way that they're speaking to her in the court and the way that they are treating her as if she's not a real human being, and Jaross is like writing that, you know, I, I didn't realize that people on trial don't get to speak whenever they want. You know, she's, she's writing it not as like a reporter, she's writing it as a person who happens to be sitting in the court just who's fascinated by this thing. Draws nonfiction, she doesn't seem to censor herself. No, not yeah. at all. And, yeah. that's, and it's, it really is this like weird blending of fiction and nonfiction, no matter what she's writing about. She just can't help it. And yeah. it's so interesting. And also, you know, it, it means that often she says things that are wrong. Like the example, was it in Summer 80 where she, um, she like praises the American involvement in Libya? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. She's, yeah. She has some opinions, um, but she. Uh, but it's interesting too because you get this sense in Summer of '80 of this older woman 
at a TV screen, <laughs> right? And then also reading the newspapers and then looking out the window at yeah. the sea watching this other drama. Yeah, you really get every, you really get, like everything that's happening, you're also seeing her seeing it happen and writing it down. And I think, so as we were kind of going back and forth with um, the editors of Dorothy, Marty, and Danielle, who were just so lovely to work with from start to finish, uh, we would send ideas and we were trying to kind of find like an umbrella of a theme that everything could fit together in. And we had thought that we were working towards the idea of like hybrid fiction, nonfiction, and like where Duras can't draw the line and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then Danielle came back to us one day and said, I think that what's actually happening here is we're, we're all really drawn to these texts where it's not about the blending of fiction and nonfiction. It's that Duras is talking about herself yeah. through everything else that she's writing about. Like no matter what she's writing about, whether she's writing about the strikes or this court case or, you know, like Libya or whatever it is, she's actually just writing about herself. There are these incredible digressions that I want to speak in a moment about what it was like to translate these digressions. But there's one piece that's called Flaubert is, and it begins, Flaubert is the greatest writer, and nowhere does she return back to Flaubert in the piece. <laughs> no. It's, there, so there are two pieces in here that are super rambling and strange and, and um, that, have, that kind of feel like someone having a fever dream and like writing mm -hmm. down what they're talking about or thinking about, and those were two, the two pieces that Olivia like really fought for to be in yeah. here. And I was sort of on the fence about them. I found them really confusing and like very hard to translate or even understand. And Olivia was just like felt very strongly that it was worth it. And I agree. I'm so happy now that they're in here because they're really rewarding. But God, there are things in here that literally don't make sense. And it's hard. <laughs> you don't have access to an author. You don't have access. You know, she's dead. And also she didn't, there's not a lot written about those specific pieces. Right. And she also was known for, at this stage, um, drinking a lot. And I don't mean that as a joke. I mean, literally, she was, she had a drinking problem. And, right, yeah. And so there are some things yeah. in here that there were, like, at the end of one of those two pieces, there's a line about um, Mozart being in, the, in New Guinea or something, and it has nothing to do with anything. And we sent yeah. this... There's a very bourbon yeah. quality to some of the sentences. There's, yeah, and there, yeah. there's like one specific paragraph where we sent it to probably 10 different people and said, do you have any idea what this means? We sent it to the man who wrote the introduction, who's like a scholar of Duras. We sent it to multiple native French speakers. Olivia is also a native French speaker. And everyone came back and said, this doesn't make sense. And at a certain point, we had to say, you know, maybe it didn't make sense because she wasn't in her right mind when she wrote it. Maybe it doesn't make sense because it did, she didn't mean for it to make sense. And that was one of those moments where we had to just say, we, we can't force it to make sense in English because it doesn't make sense in French. And we just have to let it be weird and not freak out that people are going to think we like did something to the text or tampered with the text and just let Duras be Duras in English. Well, reading the little pieces, I thought actually a lot about Robert Walzer and the idea of rambling. And a lot of Walzer's pieces were a few atons written for newspapers. Mm. So there is a sense of like, you really do unpack these sentences that have this aesthetic to rambling to them. And there is a lot of pleasure There's in that. There's a lot of pleasure yeah. in them what, when, when you're reading them. Yeah. And then when you're translating them, it's the worst thing in the world. <laughs> What was it like for the reading public to read these? Were these very sensational pieces? I mean, we talked about the early, like, kind of fait de ver, like, pieces, the crime pieces. But, like, Summer 80, was it, was, was it a, a big deal? Was she this kind of unbreakable star at the time who was given full license? My understanding from what I've, I'm, I don't claim to be, like, a Duras expert, but... Uh, my understanding from what I read around Summer 80 was that it wasn't really, it didn't really, because because it was published in a newspaper and so people weren't buying it as a book, it was eventually later published as a book, but that like critics were really excited about it mm -hmm. and really did think it was sort of this turning point for Duras's writing, but that the general public wasn't necessarily, you know, like paying attention to it. I don't think it was, you know, it wasn't The Lover, it wasn't. Right. Anything like that. But but critics were like very, all the things written about it are 
just like, this is incredible. You know, this is the most beautiful writing we've ever had from Duras. This is, you know, the most beautiful writing she's done about the sea. This is the most interesting thing she's done because she's like changing the way she's writing in this book. It's interesting to think of a conceptual writing project in a newspaper. Like you have yeah. Liz Spector's Chronicas or <laughs> like Sophie Kell's address book. It's hard to think of anything really being like that in an American newspaper, just saying like you have free reign to kind of do whatever you want in this incredibly conceptual way. Yeah, I think she's one of those, I, I, I think maybe, you know, like today's example would be... Laws guard at the gas station or whatever, yeah, the or, road trip. Or like, I, I bet, you know, if Elena Ferrante wanted right. to write whatever she wanted and then turned it in seven weeks late and like only did two out of the eight things she Can was you imagine to, editing Dura? Yeah. Like people would be really Man. excited. They would still be, you know, just yeah. like very happy that she had turned in anything at all, so. I wonder if Dura allowed herself to be edited at these nonfiction pieces. I'm sure she didn't. I'm sure no. I'm sure she did. Yeah. yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm sure she said, I will only do this if you do not touch them. Yeah. It seemed like um, I read Dan Gunn's introduction, very good introduction, and it seemed like, you know, the nonfiction pieces were this place of experimentation, obviously, but also this deadline was very useful for her. But also, it seemed like she published a lot of nonfiction at that time for money as well. Yeah, and some of the I think some so some of the pieces that we did not include in here are things that are super straightforward. Like, you know, she wrote about. Um, these uh, a slaughterhouse in this like random town outside of Paris, and it was very straightforward. There was not a lot of experimental writing going on. It was just like, I can't believe the conditions at this slaughterhouse. Yeah. Um, and then there were other things like she wrote under a pseudonym. Um, she wrote a lot of like things for women's magazines and, under a pseudonym. Yeah, and she has she also had like recipes that she published, and she had things like. One bottle of scotch. Yeah, correct. Right. End of recipe. Um, and, Sorry, that's yeah. not a but, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, and, and so some of the, like the profiles in here, for example, we have a, there's a profile of um, Yves Saint Laurent that she did that absolutely was for money. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was an introduction to a book. It wasn't um, in a newspaper, actually. But things like she had a lot of profiles in news. She did a lot of profiles for Vogue about, like, famous actresses of the day, Brigitte Bardot, um, like other, just any famous starlet you can think of in the time in France she wrote a profile on. And they're very Durossian profiles, but she's doing them for money. And yeah. it's definitely, you know, different writing. And the things, like, some of, most of the things in here, there's some letters she wrote to um, different centers. There's a, th a little thing. There's a really beautiful piece on translation that she wrote to a center because she was supposed to be the letters guest of honor. Yeah. yeah, the letter, like, and the letters. So these things are things she's not writing for money. I mean, um, she's Marguerite Duras. She's writing everything for money at that point. Right. So it's right. Not, yeah. But yeah, like some of some of the we tried to kind of skew away from the things that were more blatantly like she she wasn't particularly excited about what she was writing about. Well, let's move to the, your translation. So that letter about translation, I think it's also really hilarious that she writes this beautiful essay as a letter when, re, when turning down yeah. attending, attending a conference on translation. Yeah. She writes, you tran this is your translation. Everyone knows that translation is not a matter of the literal exactitude of a text, but perhaps we must go even further and say that it is more of a musical approach rigorously personal and even if necessary deviant and in the same passage she muses that perhaps musical translation is like musical interpretation mm -hmm. um did did that line give you some permission while you were translating um can you speak to that and how you saw yourself as the translator of these like amazing unwieldy deviant sentences yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously it's really comforting when you read an author writing about translation and they understand that translation can't be a literal, like a game of equivalence, um, because you'd like to think that everyone has, shares that idea, but then you, you know, there's always someone who doesn't. And so it's, it's nice to have it in writing that Duras really cares about the musicality of the text and the rhythm of the words and, and that it's not about matching word for word. And, the, what's funny about the word deviant in there is that, oh, I can't remember what it is in the French, 
but it's a word that can mean lots of things, that has mm -hmm. a million possibilities of translation into English. And obviously we had to make a choice and we chose the word deviant mm -hmm. for a reason. And um, I think it's really nice. Um, and maybe someone else would have made a different choice there, but uh, we, we felt that the word deviant fit there. And I think for us, um, you know, Duras has been translated a million times, or probably about a hundred times, um, by at least ten different people. Um, and some of the translations are are pretty old, and some there have been recent translations from Open Letter too. Um, and she has a different voice. And you know, if you read, I don't read her a lot in English. I don't like her as much. Uh, in English, um, or like some of the things that have been published in English, I don't, I don't, they don't read to me like Duras. Mm -hmm. And Olivia and I really wanted to kind of not have any of those voices in our heads and really follow the rhythm and the musicality of her language and kind of let her voice be like as close as possible to how we hear and feel her. And when we read her in French, we wanted that to come out in the English. And so I would say probably. Um, if you compared our translation to other translations, her voice is going to sound pretty different. And um, I'd like to think that ours kind of hues really closely to the rhythm of the French. I once knew a French translator who I told them that uh, about this writer who was very inspired by Dura, and they said, how could they be inspired by Dura if they've only read Dura in the English, which I've thought about ever since. So I, mean, I want to can... ask you about that. I think, I mean, a lot of writers I'm inspired by have read in translation, and I think if it's a good translation, um, you can you can feel the voice and the spirit and the the thing, all of the things that someone might experience reading the text in French. You can experience reading the text in English, even if it's different words. If it's a bad translation, then you won't. And I, I won't name names, and I won't name Ooh, the book. Ooh, I want to know. But uh, we'll talk about it after. But draw is so much about voice, and I've thought about that a lot lately. And when we think of voice in writing, what are we talking about, really? I mean, for me, so to not to embarrass you, but I want to draw a comparison to your work. I think oh, okay. so. A lot of your books, your books, <laughs> but your so your books are all very different from each other, but, mm -hmm. but, but they all kind of share this quality. You know you're reading one of your books, or I... Yeah, I don't I, even know what that is, because I don't feel... I, I feel like every time I... Like, every year, I'm like a completely different person. Like, it, everything, totally. yeah. But for... So, like, for example, when I read O Fallen Angel, and then when I read Green Girl, yeah. even though they're different from each other, there are, like, similar textures to them, like the capitals and the, you know, uh -huh. like, the sentence structures, and the... There's, like, a brazenness to... The, like, there's thing Like, you... It's still your your voice, even though they're different books, and even though you're writing a little bit differently. Uh -huh. And I think with Duras, all of her books, especially because she wrote over such a long period of time, and her writing style changed a lot, and she did lots of different kinds yeah. of writing. She changed. I mean, she was the 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 young woman in so much. You know, the cover of this book, this older yeah. woman looking out, is she's completely transformed and changed. And I love this cover. I think they yeah, did an amazing, amazing job. Um, I think it's really special that they chose her at this age. So voice is something about how the reader experiences a work. I, I mean, for me, when I read, no matter what, like one of my favorite draw, my favorite book in the world, and my favorite draws book is Moderato Cantabile, and That's that was beautiful. something she wrote very early on. Yeah versus The Lover, which she wrote much later, versus Summer 80, which she wrote much later. The Lover and Summer of 80 have so much more of a connection to each other. Yeah, but the, but like there's still a, a way that she writes about things and a way that she talks about like love or emotion or people or interactions that still you you know you're reading Duras. Like no one else writes like her. And is it true that like Duras has a very spoken or conversational quality to a lot of this later work? Um, I don't know that I can speak to that. I don't... It's interesting, though, that a couple of your pieces are from, like, a film where she's right. talking. Well, those two really trans... weird ones, yeah. yeah, are are transcriptions of... And then practicalities are also right. conversations. Yeah, and I think... I feel like those texts feel different than the other texts, but there's still this, like, shared quality across them that she's not ever editing herself. You know, she's probably editing her writing, but I mean in the sense of she's not 
she's so unhindered in what she writes, and you can tell that she writes about things exactly the way she wants to, and without kind of trying to change herself for a publication. It's like when you enter into the space of Summer 80, you feel like you're channeling this performance. There's like this energy of performance to it, mm -hmm. and this sense of like a, like a spell or a, or a trance, I think, that you wrote in the afterward. Yeah. I mean, because it's all, uh, even though she's jumping between different things, she's jumping between fiction and nonfiction and different stories and stories within stories in her own life, it's all, it's all like happening, there's no paragraph breaks. And there's yeah. no, it's not like paragraph ends and then she's talking about the Moscow Olympics. It's like sentence, period, Moscow. You know, it's like all flows into one piece. And you get a real sense of the shape of her mind yeah. as she's thinking through And she all even of this. talks about the writing process in one of the chapters too. And it's, oh, it's so interesting. Well, she says when she was writing 1980, the summer of 80, that she had to, one day she would go through the news, and then the second day, what, she would fall into a trance? Yeah, she And then says, the third day, everything would be erased, and it would be nothing, and then she could write. I'm paraphrasing your translation. Do you want to read it? Um, uh, it would take me an entire day to enter into the current events. It was the hardest day, to the point that I would often give up. It would take me a second day to forget, to emerge from the darkness of these facts, from their promiscuity, to regain the surrounding air. A third day to erase what had been written, comma, to write. So to write is to erase what had been written. Yeah. And she speaks of that throughout the, the work, the idea that to write is to stand before a book that has not been written, is to stand before nothingness. Right. Oh, she's so good. <laughs> <laughs> but while translating, you have this whole text that you're working through. Yeah. It's a very different process. It's a very different process. And, and I think part of what really worked for me and Olivia, I mean, Olivia and I had like a lot of arguments as we were translating, as co-translators are wont to do. Um, and especially, it was, it, there were times when it was really difficult because Olivia is a, a native French speaker and I'm not. There were cer certain times when we would argue over, like, we need, to, you know, Olivia would say, we need to keep this because of the rhythm and the way that the words sound and blah, blah, blah. And I would say, yes, but in English, she now sounds clunky and she doesn't sound clunky in mm -hmm. French. And it was this constant tug of war and compromising and figuring out, you know, how to do that. But she. Um, Did you translate sentence to sentence together? No. No. No, we split it up like half and half. So we would split it up by article for the articles at the beginning, and then for summer 80, we each did half of the chapters, and then we would send each other, we would each edit each other's, and then we would do, and we would argue for like hours over Skype. Um, so long. <laughs> but what I, what I think like really helped us come out and be able to do this together is that we both kind of come at translation from an emotional point of view and not like an academic y thinky point of view and so we would argue about things but we would ultimately be trying to figure out how we felt and like trying to get the emotion right and that is so much more valuable to me with Dara specifically. The emotions. I, the emotions, mm -hmm. the way she, like her writing kind of literally makes you feel as you read it is so much more valuable than trying to think about, you know, oh, what was Duras thinking about in some way? Like who cares? It's, mm -hmm. it's all, it, for Dara specifically, it was so much more about the feeling and because Olivia and I both kind of agreed on that from the start and come at translation from that way, despite all the hours of arguing over Skype, we came out on the other side. Um, so I'd like to speak of a draw sentence specifically. So you, um, as, you, as you said, you were most interested in, in the rhythm of the draw sentences and the rhythm the sentences form together. And um, on Twitter, you said that your favorite sentence was, then after some time, the young girl said she would prefer that it be like this between her and him. She said, colon, that it'd be utterly impossible. She said, colon, that it'd be utterly hopeless. Colon makes it very inelegant. But I just yeah. want to point out the like really uh, lyric use of punctuation yeah. in that sentence. We had a lot of back and forth about the punctuation, but there were certain things even like, what, what I really liked about working with Dorothy is they really respected our decisions yeah. to keep 
the weird punctuation of the French because she is doing something so specific with her punctuation to cut up a sentence like that with multiple colons and then not a capital afterwards. It's all one sentence, but she wants you to stop and she wants you to say, to hear, she said, and then what she said. It's just so... Yes, and the repetition. And the repetition is so... Like, repetition is big. Yes. And uh, it was very... They very much respected us keeping all of that in. Um... And to, yeah, to, so the comma too, like all the commas and draw were, yeah. I thought about that a lot when I was reading. Would you mind reading some of 10 sure. from summer 1980 where I thought it was just so trance-like and complicated? Any particular part? Or just well, the one that begins the summer, the September tides are here, the sea is white. For, for how long? I don't just know. A, just a little <laughs> we'll bit? Okay. We'll we, we'll, we'll, The September tides are here. The sea is white, mad, mad with madness, with chaos. It struggles the whole night through. It charges at the piers, the clay cliffs. It shreds, it guts the blockhouses, the sands. Mad, you see, mad. We shut our houses. We bring in the sailboats. We shut it all. It takes, returns, gathers. We sleep on its litter, the thunder of its depths, its wails, the long moan of its insanity. In the morning, the sea always dies down. And then always, yes, as soon as the night wind comes, look, it starts up again. Yes, as soon as the night comes, it rages on and on. I am in the black room. You are here. We look outside. The sea and the movement of the two distant shapes of the young girl and the child, they walk along the whiteness, on the nakedness, on the beach. They don't come any closer. They don't speak. There's no wind. It only comes at night with the changing of the tide. We are locked into the space of the sea with its madness. It doesn't want to cross this equinox line, this equality between day and night, this astral angle. It doesn't want to. This rule of the sky, this law, it doesn't want to. This equator sun, every time it rages on, carried away by the grip of its own power, its waters heaving toward the origins of the world, it wails. I have to think that you probably read it out loud a lot when you were. How beautiful is that? Though? Yeah. God. Darass. Also, the sea is white, mad, mad with madness. It's just amazing. And I but love like the kind of bonkers. The I am in the black room. You are here. We look outside. Mm-hmm. Do you remember translating that no. passage? <laughs> it feels very like rhythmic, hypnotic, and yeah. the whole, all those passages those passages begin to build like the sea. There is yeah, that sense of it. Yeah, it is very much... She So she wrote about this book that she thinks this is the most beautiful writing she did about the sea, and I 100% agree. The way she writes about the sea in this book, it's a book about the sea, really. Basically, yeah. More than it is about the summer of 1980, it's really about the sea. And I think even the ending... Um, oh, yeah. Chills. Um, yeah, it's it's so... So and so there was this um, moment in the translation uh, in your afterward in your essay you wrote afterward about the quality or maybe this was actually in Dara's essay and now I'm confusing the two I'm not sure but about the idea of being overworked versus being worked in a draw sentence. Oh, I don't know. Was that, that you or is that her? See, I don't even know now. I don't know either. But it's interesting because um, her sentences are that they don't have this too overworked quality to them. You're yeah, sen- and I think it's so hard because when you're translating something, you are overworking it by definition because you are choosing, trying to choose the right word. So you're changing the words constantly. You're editing. You're fine tuning. You're trying to make it sound good. You're trying to make it sound sensical. And really, her sentences resist that and feel very much like they want to just flow and they don't want to be pinned down. And there were there were a lot of, like, when we got our edits back, there were a lot of things like, this doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, what's, what's go on? What's yeah. the problem? And, and I think, like, the, we really had to fight the urge to kind of pin down the sentences right. the way you really want to do in translation because you want to make sure you understand the sentence so that you can put it in English accurately. But sometimes things don't make sense. Sometimes they just sound really good. And sometimes... There, you know, there's a build to them, and they're operating in a certain way. And the more you try to pin them down, the the less they are like the original. 
I don't know if it's interesting or not, but I struggled whether or not to say her sentences or your sentences. Mm. But they're her sentences, but they're also, in a way, your sentences. I know this yeah. is very, very simplistic reading of translation, but with a text like this, with how complicated the sentences are, like how, how did you think about that in terms of language and the sentences? Certainly not every Dura translation is the same. No, certainly not. Um, I think we, it really helped to have two people working on this, two people who are so obsessed with Duras working on it, because if, if one of us felt like the other had taken too many liberties or had brought it too far from what Duras sounds like in French, then we were very quick to kind of pick that out to each other and work together to bring it back to a place that sounded like Duras in English. And I think having also working with a native French speaker on this was a godsend for me um, and for her to you know if there were things that I sometimes when I'm translating there's a question of this is weird to me but is it would it be weird to a native French speaker and so having that answer which was almost always for this book yes it's very weird in French too um, was hugely helpful because then it kind of gave me permission to let things be weird in English as well and I think for us, it was really important that when we read it out loud to ourselves in English, it sounded like we were reading Duras in French, mm -hmm. and like that the same rhythm was there, that the same quality of the of the um, text was there, that the same kind of word choices, the same syllables, the same that kind like of thing. Like the C, you write that the C was non-negotiable. The that, C was non-negotiable yeah. because la mer is not ocean, you know. Right. And there's like there's a sonic quality that's important yeah. of the C, la mer, like all of that, and. We did have a long debate about whether to make the C she, uh -huh. which ultimately we didn't make the C she, but we were debating it because there's an interview where Duras talks about the C and, and in English says she. And in French, obviously, la mer, it's feminine, so it's L. Throughout this whole book, it's like L, 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 which means she, 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 but, al but also just like in French, every neutral every gen like you know object inanimate object has a gender so like it's like if i'm talking about the table la table would also be she and that's not necessarily imbuing it with meaning or personifying mm -hmm. it and so there's this question of it was she trying to personify the c or was she just using l because that's how you do it in french and when we saw this interview she wasn't talking about this book but she was referring to the c as she and we had this moment of oh god should we be using she and ultimately decided we couldn't make that decision because it would be such a, it would change the way the text was read so much in English. And without knowing whether she was actually personifying the sea in this book, we didn't feel comfortable making that leap. Um, especially because La Source, the river that's also in the story within the story about mm -hmm. David, is personified. And so we wanted there to be a distinction between the sea, which may or may not have been personified, and then La Source, the river, which definitely was. So. Difficult, difficult debates with Duras. When you translate a living author, is there usually back and forth or discourse? Is that different than translating someone who's long dead? Uh, sometimes. I mean, I've worked, I've had authors I've worked with like too closely mm -hmm. um, who like read my translation line by line and you know, it's like they've gone through it with a thesaurus and will tell me like, uh -huh. you use definitely here, I'd rather it be certainly. And <laughs> But, um, <laughs> but sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear. But you're um, always allowed to swear. Sure. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I've had authors who are very much alive, but I just I don't interact with them. I don't have questions that need to be answered by them, and we don't like have contact. Mm -hmm. Like Virginie Despont, mm -hmm. who's like too big a deal to answer emails. Mm. So she, you know, I, but I like didn't need, you know, I didn't have any interaction with her when I translated her, except that she had to like approve my sample. But then, mm. you know, with, with a dead author, it's hard because with someone like Duras, there are so many things written about her, yeah. but there's so many conflicting things written yeah. about her. And there's also so many, she exists in so many different voices in English mm -hmm. that it almost feels like we just kind of shut out all the noise and mm -hmm. didn't uh, try to engage with all the scholarship around her mm -hmm. because it's so, there's too much. And that's kind of how she 
is writing about the process of, of reading throughout this as well. You read a book, you become a book. There's no subjective relationship between you and the author you're reading. This is your translation. I have nothing to do with it. It's completely finished. I did it. The name still exists, that's all. I will die with the unknown who is writing. I will die with writing. Yeah, so she's the translation is the act of reading for her. Right, and she's also basically saying like, you read a book and you think you have a connection to the author and you don't. Yeah. Which is interesting. <laughs> it's interesting. Do you agree with that? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think the text exists on its own, right? So you have a relationship with that text or whatever voice is within that text. Okay, well, I think let's open it up to questions that you might have for Emma. <laughs> Hi. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that you left out the pieces that were in vogue. Um, was there any concern that you might be portraying her in sort of a particularly like eccentric light by leaving out those pieces at all? So, um, I mean, for us, we we didn't we left them out because they sort of didn't fit in with the other texts in the book more so than that we were trying to portray her a certain way. But like, I mean, we did we did think about including one of her profiles that was in vogue and ultimately, um, I don't know if I ever actually finished my sentence earlier when I was trying to, to get to the, the point, which, which was that we thought these texts were, we were accumulating them to be an example of her hybrid text when really what we were doing was showing texts that were about her. Mm -hmm. And so the profiles that came out in Vogue that she was writing for money are like, they didn't fit in to, they were, because they were literally profiles of other people, mm -hmm. they were the ones that like, where she actually extracted herself the most. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't kind of fit in with the theme of what we were, um, the writings we were really drawn to for this, which the title, me, and other writing is because there's a piece in here literally called Me, where she's she's writing about, um, let me get to it. She's writing about uh, what happened in Libya and the raid on Libya, and she's talking about her position on it. And then for some reason out of nowhere, the ending is just, but I don't believe in dreams, I write. What moves me is myself. What makes me want to cry is my violence, is me. It has nothing to do with anything else in this article. And so I think what we were, it wasn't so much that we wanted to leave out the Vogue pieces because they were, you know, like a particular side of her and more so that they, we just had to curate for this book and those were the ones that least exemplified this idea of her writing about herself. And it doesn't read like an anthology of her nonfiction. In fact, um, I'm curious who made the decision to, it's a very interesting decision to take, make the end notes only in the back. So the effect is you do read it like it's in some ways one continuous text. Yeah, and I think what's funny is that I think every review that's come out of this has like objected to the <laughs> way that the texts don't feel like a, a, like a cohesive anthology, which mm -hmm. the idea of Dross being cohesive is silly to me. It's is, fragmented by yeah. its form. Like, I mean, yeah. it's fragmented by I its I mean, very everything nature. she wrote, nothing, you know, nothing is like smooth and goes together. And I think we, like the idea of them being about herself was the, is the only thing that can unite any of her writings mm -hmm. because like she really was so into herself, um, but, yeah, I mean, she also loved her books. She loved her she books. Loves her. Loved her films. Yeah, I want to um, know like where, like where to get that Durazian confidence, yeah. confidence Just from. Just drink a lot, I think. <laughs> um, I'll consider but, it. But uh, yeah, I, I don't. It wasn't meant to be. Um, cohesive. It was just meant to show the way that she explored like her own vision of herself through like other events. Thank you. This is such a fascinating conversation. I'm so into this. I have never translated anybody as famous as Marguerite Duras. And I'm wondering when you're working on an author who, as you were saying, Emma, has been picked over by all of these scholars, has been translated by a hundred million zillion different people, and where you know that this translation is also going to get a degree of that kind of scrutiny, right? Is there like, 
it, do you feel like an extra sense of responsibility? Do you feel like a lot of anxiety about what all of these other people are going to think about your translation? Or do you just, like you said, do you just kind of shut out the noise and do whatever you think is, is, is sort of your, your instinct for it? Uh, yes, there's a lot of anxiety and yes, I felt a lot of pressure, and I think Olivia did too. Not I, I want to speak for her, and I don't want to speak for her. Um, but I, the two of us, when you know, we heard that the galleys were going out, and we knew that there would be some reviews, we did feel very nervous, and especially because I know for a fact that our translation of Duras is is not similar to other voices um, that have come out in her translation, especially not the most famous books. Um, which were translated so long ago and won't ever get, have a chance to be retranslated. Why is that? Why copyright. would you never a copyright? Yeah. Okay. Um, but uh, <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> uh, and I mean, I think the the copyright on most of her most famous books isn't up for another thirty years, and then you know. And then there will be fifty versions of the lover. We'll see if if you know. We'll see what the world is like then if we're not all underwater. That's um, true. But. She, uh, <laughs> But I, but, but I, I think like we really trusted each other, and we we really put a lot of faith in each other. And um, you know, I think as two people who are just in awe of Duras and want to do nothing but bring her voice into English the way that we hear it and the way that we experience it in French, and to have a native French speaker working on it, and you know, having Dan Gunn um, and like Marty and Danielle of Dorothy. Also, kind of in, I don't think we, we kind of just at a certain point said, we can't go wrong with this, this team of people. We can't go wrong with two people who are just so moved by Duras and who understand her in this way. And like, you know, to have, um, to have that, we just had to have faith that, that we could, we couldn't do wrong um, by, by following our emotional connection to her. And, and I did, we did have to kind of shut out. We didn't read, we didn't like reread the other translations and we didn't, um, you know, kind of try to make our text more ac based in academic or whatever. We didn't try to justify it. We just believed that we, we did the absolute best we could do. And when we read it out loud, we, we heard Duras and um, we felt Duras. And uh, therefore we, we had done something right and just kind of had to put faith in that. But, it, I'm still very anxious about it. Can you tell us about when you first knew you wanted to be a translator and if Duras played any role in that moment? Yeah, I just um, wrote a whole Facebook post about this exact thing, so I'm <laughs> a little embarrassed. Um, but basically, to tell the story, um, I mentioned the book Moderato Cantabile earlier, which is an early Duras book. and. For some reason, it was assigned in my AP French class, um, and nobody could read it in my class. We, none of us had the skills to read this book, and our teacher had to print out summaries for us that she had written of each chapter because she really wanted us to pass the AP French exam and knew that this book was way over our heads. And, but like just reading her summaries and trying to piece together the French, I was so moved by this book specifically and by Duras and the way that she wrote about people and the way that we interact with each other and the way that we experience love and like passion and lust. And um, I just I just like became totally obsessed with her. And so then when I went to college, you know, I kept studying French and um, I was in comparative literature, which just meant that I was reading books and then writing essays about books. And that felt extremely unsatisfying to me. And when I found out that there was a translation major at my school, it just seemed like the perfect way to put my like interest in language and my interest in books into to use doing producing something tangible and producing something uh, that was helping other people to read the things that I had read and been really moved by and kind of allowing more voices to exist in English um, rather than like continuing to put my own out there um, and it it just if anyone is also very interested in languages and books, but feels like really unsatisfied with just the experience of, of reading them. Translating is so satisfying and so beautiful and like just a really nice way to engage with books and engage with authors. And um, 
you know, instead of producing more stuff, we can just share stuff that's already out there. We have time for just two more questions. Hi, uh, could you just speak a little bit about translating humor and how, um, you know, social norms will affect how something is funny in French? Um, a lot of French writers have this sort of very serious sense of humor, but it's really funny. Uh, and I know you've translated Virginie Despentes, which is hilarious. Uh, so, you know, just thinking about translating humor and how, how to do that. Oh, I don't know that I have a great answer to that. I think, um, I, I think like there's definitely way, like certain authors and, and who are writing in French and whose humor is really specific or not specific to the French language, but just the jokes are different in literature in French than they would be in English. Like it's actually Anne Goretta, who I think of, who, she, you know, when she talks about her own writing, she cracks herself up and she thinks she's so funny and she is really funny. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that people find her much less funny in English. And um, <laughs> because her jokes are so like subtle and intricate and clever and like based on wordplay and based on, you know, absurdism in this really particular way that we like don't really do in English. And so when I bring her into English, I have to find ways to kind of, um, get that same effect across. And uh, one, one thing I wrote that I think I managed to make funny was she had this play on um, their expression, mystery gul de pomme or gul de bum or gul de gum or something like mystery and bubble gum, which um, is our version of uh, like mystery wrapped in a riddle, wrapped in an enigma. And she had switched the letters around so that it sounded like other words but it was like supposed to be funny that she had done that because in French, sorry, not to make fun of her, but like <laughs> in, in French, you can like switch letters around and make new words so easily because all the words sound the same. And then in, <laughs> and in English, like just switching the letters around wasn't gonna work both because our language doesn't work like yeah. that and because it's not funny. Like it's not, it's yeah. not funny that I moved letters around, right? Um, but so I made it mystery wrapped in a, in a riddle wrapped in an enema which I oh. thought, okay, some That's people funny. find that funny. Yeah. Um, and so I think it's like kind of catering to what you think people will laugh at and like changing it slightly and making, like for me, making things a little bit less subtle, I think when I translate, but also sometimes, you know, trusting that some humor and some jokes are universal and, um, and that we can all kind of share it in certain experiences and we can all share in the fact that like when absurd things happen it's funny and um and so i think like i try to trust as much as i can that that humor can be universal and that what one author thinks is funny we can find funny too and i i try not to change too much unless i think like it needs to be less subtle like with angretta does that answer that Do we have one hand I'm not a French speaker, and thus I'm not a French reader either. Um, I have, I'm, I'm now worried, I've loved Marguerite de Ross since I was in high school, but now I'm thinking I actually love Barbara Bray. Uh, she's okay to love, she's, she's great. Well, and, yeah. and, but it brings up the, the question of if, uh, like so many of us who read uh, translations, and, and we don't even think about the fact that we're, um, maybe a huge diet of our reading is translations and, and what is lost in translation. For Marguerite de Ross especially, what did you keep coming across that you felt was what people seemed to get right and what you thought was in, ineffable for the, particularly for the English uh, translators? Um, I haven't, I will say I haven't read all, like I haven't read that much in English of Dross just because I, I prefer, if I can read the French, I'd prefer to read the French and I don't wanna like um, nitpick, but I, I there, there are certain, like there's one um, translation of hers where in mm -hmm. the French, the title is the um, Le Ravissement de, de Lolvistein, mm -hmm. and the English is the Ravishing of Lolstein and they've cut out the V, why? Why do that? And, and a lot of her translators well, specifically, a couple have done that kind of thing where in English, certain things are Americanized or like 
place names are changed to be less foreign, little things like that where I don't understand why someone would, would change like a place name or change yeah. the title, take out the middle initial, for what reason? And things like that we kept coming across that we found very frustrating, that um, little things like the textures of the language had been changed. But also, so a big thing for us in translating her was this idea of like the trance-like repetition, the the unending sentences, the the like little, you know, the commas, the not breaking up sentences, all of that. And I I think in some of um, her translations in the past, there's been a temptation to um, kind of cut down on that, as if as if that like sentences are broken up in a certain way, or like punctuation is fixed. Like she has a lot of weird, you know, semicolons that appear in the middle of sentences for no reason. That like an editor's immediate thought is, let me fix that. And mm -hmm. it's, but she's done it for a reason. Mm -hmm. Why, if it's, it, it's wrong in French too, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so I think for, the, the recent translations have been really great about like not flattening that stuff out and letting this kind of weird rhythm that she creates through her weird use of punctuation come through. And I think, unfortunately, some of that got lost in the, in the older translations, but that's true of anybody you read, not, not to, shatter illusions, but you'll like with what, with what happened with Clarice Lispector, if anyone's a fan of hers, how she was just retranslated because all the old translations had, had very much flattened out her voice um, and kind of robbed her language of, of what made her so special. And it happens to, you know, the way that we think about translation has changed so much from, from where it used to be even just a few decades ago. And I think that's really great that we're kind of evolving and allowing translation to breathe in this way and really hew closer to musicality and rhythm and tone and voice right, as opposed to like literal equivalents and, um, and like fixing or Americanizing um, authors. And uh, we, we tried really to, to kind of let her be very French and let her be very Duras. And um, Barbara Bray also, I think, did a great job of that. And so if those are the translations you loved, I think you're reading Duras. You know, I think you're getting, you're getting Duras. Let's give them a great big hand. Thank you, too.